Well, last week we began our study through Paul's letter to Titus. If you'll turn to Titus chapter 1, and we kind of noticed right out of the gate that Paul's introduction, it was more lengthy than most of what he had written. And it's not really what you had expected in a personal letter to the man that he had been personally mentoring. But we saw that this was Paul establishing Titus's authority among all the churches in Crete, that he is now calling him to put in order and to appoint elders in every church. Well, in this introduction, Paul opens up his heart and he lets us come in and see what drove this great leader and man of God. So rather than just kind of hurry by them, I wanted to dwell and kind of glean the principles to grow us as leaders in this area that God has called us to. And so I'm kind of giving you what I'll call a treatise on leadership. And if I could say anything about leadership, it must be marked by integrity. What that could do for our country would be absolutely powerful, and what it could do for the church of God would be beautiful. Integrity is the missing ingredient to much of our leadership today and just much of who we are as people. Integrity is being committed to the truth or to principles that are not optional, and so they they can't be bent or twisted or manipulated. We're absolutely committed to them. And so that is what we are looking at, is what was Paul committed to? What was Paul's integrity that he would not turn from? And I've been giving you an outline where Paul gives us five commitments in verses 1 through 4 into what really made this great leader and man of God that he was. First, we see that he was committed to God's mastery of his life. He was committed to God's mission. He was committed to God's message. He was committed to God's means, and he was committed to God's men. So last week, we only looked at the first two. He was committed to God's mastery of his life. Paul says, I'm a a doulos. I'm a slave. And really, the gospel is when your eyes have been opened and you've been regenerate. Jesus now is the, the Lord of lords. He is the Lord of your life. And I'm a slave. And so I've been crucified with Christ, and it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And so there's a death that must take place where you come now, and I'm, I'm a slave to God. Has that taken place in your life? This is how you know if you've been born again. God, I'm yours. You have complete rule and leadership of my life. I'm a slave to whatever you ask, I will go do. Whatever you say don't do, I won't do. You are the Lord. You're king. And that's what made Paul such a great leader. He died. And he just went wherever the Spirit led him. He, there was nowhere he would not go, chains and imprisonments, anything that was waiting for him. If God said go, Paul marched on. He was an apostolos, a messenger of Jesus Christ. The second commitment is he says, I'm a man committed to God's mission in verses 1 and 2. Paul gave us a three-pronged mission uh, from God that he had received. First, he said, I am devoted and committed for the faith of those who've been chosen of God. I am committed to evangelization. There are God's elect on every part of the continents all over the world, and I am the one who is an instrument. I go and preach this message that the elect would come to faith and be saved. I am committed to those who are elect of God that have not come to faith. And so I go and I plead and I beg and I urge all men be reconciled to God. Come to faith. Believe in Jesus Christ. I am committed for the faith of those who are chosen of God. Secondly, I'm committed to the knowledge of the truth, which is according to godliness, the epigenosis, this full knowledge, this understanding of God and His Word. I'm committed to the truth of God's Word, which we call edification. This is for the believers when they've been saved and justified. And there's a knowledge of truth that produces godliness. So if I want to be godly, if I want to grow in conformity to my God, it comes through this knowledge of the truth. I give myself to the Word of God. I grow, I know it, I learn it, and it's never just knowledge for knowledge's sake. I'm learning it to know God, to draw into Him, to see Him, behold Him, and that truth will produce a godliness. Beholding that will make you become like God. Him. And so Paul says, I am devoted to the Word of God because it produces godliness in those who will devote themselves to it. And the third prong, he said, is in the hope of eternal life. I am devoted to the, to the preaching of eternal life that comes in this gospel that gives us hope. 
And so the, he's never said that, that we're to make our hope here in Colorado. Here we have no lasting city. And we've got to fight for this because we're all trying to make paradise our life right now. And we fight for it and we struggle for it. And Paul's just saying again and again, I just keep pointing you to your blessed hope that this, this is temporary suffering. It's, it's not eternal. There's this eternal glory coming so that I consider my present sufferings not worthy to be compared with the glory that's to be revealed to me. I am devoted to the hope of eternal life. That is what we have here as the people of God. Through this gospel, we have the hope of eternal life. And that's where we left off. And so I didn't really get to finish that last prong, so I'm going to finish that, and then we'll go on to point three. So the, the hope of eternal life. I think this is such a balancer to what Paul was committed to. It kind of ties the ethics of godliness and eschatology together. There, there's some uh, who are very religious that seem only concerned about ideas and theologies. They would love to sit in a room and just discuss theology the rest of their days on earth. That's all they want to do. But what we saw last week is a knowledge of the truth that will produce godliness. So it's not enough to just get it in your head. I, I've got to get it into my heart where it brings about this change of life. And so the truth of the gospel in God's word is to result in good works. Godliness that, that Paul's going to flush out in the book of Titus, what should the truth look like? Well, we will see that in the days of he, ahead. And so our works will commend us before God or they will condemn us before God. When you die, there'll be you, God, in the way you lived your life, and you'll stand there. Paul wants godliness to mark the churches in Crete, and I want godliness to mark the church of Southside Bible. And so we need to be confronted with truth. We need the Word. We need to repent of our sins. We need to grow in godliness, and that was the passion of Paul's heart for the churches in Crete. But have you ever heard of this saying, this man is so heavenly-minded that he's no earthly good? He just lives up in heaven and does nothing here of any value for God and people are what they are saying in that statement. But the flip side of this is that he's so earthly-minded that he has no room for heaven, and that would be more the battle of American Christianity. So earthly-minded, we're not heavenly-minded, we're not set on our blessed hope. And what we see then in Paul's commitment is to a knowledge of the truth. We're devoted to that for godliness so that we will have day-to-day -day living and impact into our world and those around us. Paul is committed that this makes a difference right now in our lives. This is not just a hope of heaven and I sit on the rooftop till he comes back. This is to produce godliness right now in our lives, resting on the certain hope of eternal life drawing great encouragement on this truth of what we have at the end, a certain guaranteed hope. The two just live and they feed off each other. We are concerned about this life. We care about the spread of the gospel and our conformity to Christ. But we are looking to the blessed hope, which is the source of hope and encouragement every day in our godliness. We never lose hope of where all this is leading. I was reading in 1 Peter and I saw this principle so beautifully drawn out. He kept saying, you've been born again to a living hope. And he talks about this gospel. But he says, right now, if necessary, you've been afflicted by great trials. And you're struggling. And, and he says that you've got to keep your, your hope. The outcome is going to be eternal life. And so all of us have this gospel. We've got these lives that we live until we go home to glory. And they're going to get hard. And we're going to be tested and we're going to be tried. But this blessed hope, he says, it's living in us and it keeps us focused and looking for that day that's a coming. So the people of God are a people full of hope, full of hope. Paul was committed to preaching and proclaiming this blessed hope for the encouragement of the saints of God, of, of our glorification that is soon to come. Do you remember what he wrote to Corinth? Paul said, if we are only to hope in Christ in this life, we are among all men to be pitied. If you're just living, trying to have a moral good life and feel better about yourself in this life with no hope of the resurrection, he says, you're the, you're the most pitied of all. Go eat, drink, and be merry if there's no resurrection. And he says, if, if there is, we have everything. And that's our certainty and our foundation. And so my life is banking so much on the afterlife that I've bankrupted myself in this life. I, I am sowing 
uh, where, where moth and rust can't destroy. I am, I am seeking the kingdom of God and his righteousness. I am living for that future day of glorification. I, that is where my eyes are fixed and steadfast. I am marching on to Zion. Keep your eyes fixed on where all of this is leading. We get so lost in the, the temporariness of life. Uh, just parents, everything, all, all, of, all you're doing, you're trying to train these kids and point them to the eternal life. And so I, I pray that we'll be characterized at Southside with this blessed hope of what's coming. And so I want to make sure that no one misses the beauty of biblical hope. It, it's, not, it's not something we just hope may happen. This whole Bible was written to show you the certainty of the believer of God that it, it will happen. It, it's, there's a certainty to it. Paul says so certain, uh, if you'll come and look in Titus verse 1, Paul, a bondservant of God and apostle of Jesus Christ, for the faith of those who are chosen of God and the knowledge of the truth which is according to godliness and the hope of eternal life which God, who cannot lie, promised long ages ago. And so Paul wants you to get God can't lie. He can't do that. There's something God can't do. He can't lie. And he promised this long ages ago. And so we, we have this absolute certainty. He has promised eternal life to all who will receive and believe in his son. He wants you to bank on this. I've got to live my life in this certainty and this will change everything about you so much so that it will produce a godliness. First John says that those who have this hope purify themselves. It will purify you. It will make you holy. It will consecrate you. Listen to Hebrews 6.13. For when God made the promise to Abraham, since he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself. So everyone would swear by, I swear by my mother's grave. I, there's always something you swear greater than you. So what does God swear by? How do you find something greater than God? So God says, I swear by myself. I swear by myself that I will bless you. I will multiply you. And having patiently waited, he obtained the promise. For men swear by one greater than themselves, and with them an oath given as a confirmation is the end of every dispute. You swear on something greater, it's over. Well, in the same way, God, desiring even more to show to the heirs of the promise the unchangeableness of his purpose. I will never change. He interposed it with an oath. I swear by God that this is the way of salvation. I will hold you. I will keep you. And it will never change. There will not be a new salvation another day. In order that by two unchangeable things in which it's impossible for God to lie, we may have strong encouragement, we who have fled for refuge and laying hold of the hope that is set before us. I want you to be absolutely certain of your hope. God says that I swear by myself, the one who flees to Jesus Christ as a refuge will receive this prize and this crown. God swore by himself so we would be certain. Do you live in the guarantee and absolute certainty for the hope that is laid up for those who have loved his appearing? Do you, do you live in this certainty? Paul was committed to evangelism, and he was committed to edification, and he was committed to this encouragement of the blessed hope that we have. Keep reminding one another, evangelize, build up with the truth of God's word, and encourage each other with the blessed hope. When we're suffering and going through trials and all that we're facing, keep reminding each other, here we have no lasting city. We have something so much better. Let's keep trucking. Let's keep moving in every high and stormy gale. Let's keep marching to this certain beautiful glorification that's coming. So there it is, committed to God's mastery of his life. That's what made Paul such a great leader. He was committed to God's mission, the evangelism and edification and encouragement. And now I want to look at a third point. Paul says, I am a man then committed to God's message. If you'll look with me in verse 2. Uh, the hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised long ages ago, but at the proper time manifested even His Word and the proclamation which I was entrusted according to the commandment of God, our Savior. And so what made Paul so good of a leader is his integrity, is that my, my message is God's, and I just, I won't turn from it. 
Paul's miss, mission was tied to his message. He says it was the truth, the content of all of my evangelism, what I go share with people, what I do to build up and edify the saints of God and how I encourage them. They're not just a bunch of maxims. They're not just kind of motivational sayings that are thrown out every day or cute little phrases that we put on our Facebook walls. My message is the knowledge of the truth that comes from God. Paul says, I am committed to His Word. I taught you the whole counsel of God. I am devoted to this. This is what causes the evangelism, the edification, the encouragement, God's Word. This is the presupposition that we are losing in our day. Our day and age says you cannot have absolute truth. And that nonsense is rubbing off in the church and people are starting to believe it. And Paul says, nuh-uh. I am devoted and I am committed to the message, the absolute truth of God. I have a Bible that has been inspired by Him. It's infallible. Without error, it is perfect. I am committed to God's Word. This is God's Word breathed out in a Bible, inerrant, without error or mistake. And Paul says, this is what I preach and teach then. This is where I find my blessed hope because God said He can't lie. And everything in this is true. The amen, and I hold to it, and I preach it, and I teach it, says the Apostle Paul. If you've ever had a loved one die in faith in Jesus Christ, they're more alive today than they ever were on this earth. And they're basking in the beautiful presence of Jesus Christ with no more worries or fears or threats. They're in shalom forever. How do I know this? Because God said it, and He cannot lie. And I, I want this... To to, to begin to hold us in everything, amen? His truth, it's true. This book is the Word of God. I have a Bible that it just says one thing on it, uh, two things. It says Kenneth P. Murphy, which I could care less about, but on the side where it's on my, when I put it on my shelf, it just stands out and says the Word of God. That's all that's on it. It doesn't say who made it, Zondervan, you know, just the Word of God. I love it, and I take it to every funeral that I do to just remind me that this word says the trumpet's going to sound and the dead in Christ are going to be raised imperishable. And this is the word of God. In Titus, we're told that the Cretans are a bunch of liars. We're told that the Jewish false teachers are coming in and sowing lies. And Paul's saying, but we have the sure word of God. We have truth. We have this word. We stand on it. We preach it. We teach it. A great leader is committed to God's word alone as the source of truth for his message. He will stand up to this age and he will be unflinching in the truth of this book is what Paul is telling us. I love the young men in our church who are being trained for ministry who want to stand on this book alone. And they, they are giving themselves to know it and to learn how to study it so that they can stand up the rest of their days and say, thus saith the Lord. This is the making of a great leader for the kingdom of God. And I pray that we would do the same in our families, in our children's Sunday school, at work. Authorities who come to arrest me for standing on this book, I pray that we would all come together as one and say, I can do no other Paul's calling us. That this is our book. This is the truth. This is what we do to evangelize and edify and encourage. I don't need the thoughts of this world. I need this book, and I need it taught to me and, and preached to me by friends again and again every day. Paul says he promised it long ages ago. In the little Greek, it says, before the time of the ages. So he preached this gospel before the time of the ages. Who, who did he promise this to then? And this is what we call the covenant of redemption. Before eternity passed, all you have is the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. And they make this covenant of redemption. And the Father says, I love you, Son. And I'm going to give a redeemed humanity to you to, who will love you and praise you and worship you forever. And the Son says, I will go and I'll pay a ransom price. I will accomplish their salvation by hanging on a tree and perfectly fulfilling your law. 
And the Spirit says, I will do the work of saving and sanctifying them and securing them to the very end. And so they make this covenant of salvation. And this covenant has been revealed in such beautiful ways now from Genesis all the way to Revelation. That beautiful covenant is now being manifested in time and space starting in Genesis all the way to the last day of the new heavens and the new earth. And so it was promised long ages ago. And Paul says, but at the proper time in verse 3, he manifested it. Eternity stepped into time. Jesus Christ came into this world, born of a virgin, and He came and He fulfilled all that He covenanted to do with the Trinity. And this beautiful book called the Bible, it reveals that eternal covenant. And Paul says, that's where I get my message. That is where I preach my evangelism is that. That is how I edify the saints of God. That is how I encourage His people. Because God cannot lie this is the truth. Why would we preach and teach then anything but God's Word? Why would you get up every Sunday or go to a midweek and give so much time and effort if they give you anything but God's Word? Demand it. Demand it. we got to have this to grow. Don't settle for fanciful stories and entertainments and emotional sentiments. Preach the word in season and out of season. Amen? This is what you need for your soul. Demand it. And don't settle for the nonsense of our, our age. Give me God's word straight out, truthful, reveal it. I don't need all the stories. I need the word of God. So Paul, what made him a great leader is he was committed to God's mastery in his life. He was a slave he was committed to God's mission to evangelize and edify and encourage. And he, he was a man committed to God's message. And now in verse 3, he was a, a man committed to God's means. He was committed to God's means. What, what is the means then that, that God uses to accomplish this? And Paul says it's proclamation, keruso, to herald, to proclaim, or to preach. That is the means that God uses. And since in their day they didn't have TV or internets or newspapers, if the king wanted to communicate something to his people, you had a town crier or a herald who would go through the town and he would proclaim the king's message. And so this is the same word for preaching. It was called, I love it, in verse 3 you see it, it's the proclamation, the preaching. There's a definite article on it, Paul saying, I'm committed to the preaching. The, the proclamation of the gospel, the truth. And Luke eleven thirty two, 32, the men of Nineveh shall stand up with this generation at the judgment and condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. Jonah came and he, he preached it and Jesus says something greater than Jonah is here now. But his preaching caused them to turn. 1 Corinthians 1, Paul says, for since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God. Their smarts never did it. But God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who would believe the message. Jews asked for signs. Greeks searched for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified. To Jews, it's a stumbling block. And to Gentiles, it's foolishness. But to those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. I will preach that foolish message till I die. The foolishness of the gospel. God uses the preaching to save, to sanctify, and to encourage us in the hope of glory. Paul was committed to the means, and he had integrity that he would never be moved away from this. For his very life, they would cut his head off was the only way to shut his mouth up. There is no other name under heaven by which a man can be saved. And so, when I sit down to evangelize, there's only one thing in my mind. How do I communicate the truth of this gospel from the Word of God, not cleverness of speech, not persuasive words? God, I just want to communicate this truth to this soul. 
that you might awaken them to believe and call upon the name of Jesus Christ. When I seek to grow and edify any brother or sister in Christ, what does the Word of God say about this situation? If I have to step on your toes or hurt you, what does this Word of God say to your situation so that you can be edified and built up into Jesus Christ? And when I want to encourage anybody who's suffering, laying in a hospital, discouraged with depression or struggling, I just, what is the blessed hope that this book reveals? I've just got one message for every need, this Word of God. And it it is what we are committed to because this is the only thing that God uses for those means. I got nothing else. Paul. Colossians 1, we proclaim him, admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom that we may present every man complete in Christ. And for this purpose, I labor, the Greek word is to the point of fatigue. I I labor to the point of fatigue, striving according to his power, which mightily works within me. And so I admonish and we preach Jesus Christ for the building up of them. I've given my life to this. I don't want to beat a dead horse, but I, want to, I do want to beat a dead horse. Listen to some more scriptures on this. I want you just to listen to what Jesus did when he came to earth, the Son of God. In Matthew 4, 17, from that time, Jesus began to preach and say, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Ephesians 2, 17, and he came and preached peace to you who were far away, Gentiles, and peace to those who were near, Jews. In Acts 5, the early church now spreads, and every day in the temple and from house to house, they kept right on teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. House to house, I've got one message, Jesus is the Christ. And then in Acts 10, he ordered us to preach to the people. And solemnly to testify that this is the one who has been appointed by God as judge in the living of the dead, we preach this message. Romans 10, for whoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. How shall they call upon him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? Just as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring glad tidings of good things from the Word of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ. How are they going to believe unless someone shares it? You know who the beautiful people are? They're not the people at the, at the Gold's Gym and the Botox centers and laying out in the sun to get their tans on or the beauty parlor. That is not the beautiful people. The beautiful people are the ones who Caruso the truth of Jesus Christ revealed in this word like the ones Ray prayed for, the Hutchins and the Francos, and I pray for every soul here. You want to be beautiful? <laughs> I got ugly feet. You want beautiful feet? Go proclaim, K. Russo, the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ to anyone who will listen. Galatians 1, but only they kept hearing Paul, who once persecuted us, is now preaching the faith with the, which he once tried to destroy. He is preaching the faith now. Colossians 1, 24, now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. I am rejoicing in my sufferings for your sake. And in my flesh, I do my share on behalf of his body, which is the church, in filling up that which is lacking in Christ's afflictions. Of this church, I was made a minister according to the stewardship from God bestowed on me for your benefit that I might fully carry out the preaching of the word of God. Timothy. From childhood, Timothy, you have known the sacred writings which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Since you were a little kid, your mom taught you in the Old Testament to see Jesus Christ. You have known this since you were young. All Scripture is inspired by God. It's God-breathed. And it's profitable then for teaching, reproof, correction, and training in righteousness. So I solemnly charge you, Timothy, in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead. And by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. Never grow weary of just preaching this word again and again and again to anyone and everyone who will listen. 
Isn't it interesting how Paul just keeps reminding the ones that he's handing the mantle off, Timothy and Titus, preach the Word of God, men, never grow tired of it. Just rebuke in season, out of season, don't stop. No matter what your society wants, no matter what the church is saying they want, their ears tickled, I don't care what comes up against it, men, preach the Word of God. And look with me in verse 3. But the proper time it was manifested, even his word in the proclamation which I was entrusted. So Paul said, I, I didn't even choose this. God chose him. Listen to 1 Timothy 2, 7. And for this, I was appointed a preacher and apostle. I was appointed him. I'm telling the truth. I'm not lying as a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. 2 Timothy 1.11, for which I was appointed a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher. I was appointed. Colossians 1, of this church I was made a minister according to the stewardship from God bestowed on me for your benefit that I might fully carry out the preaching of the Word of God. And so I just want you to see, Paul didn't choose this. Don't do this. Don't do this unless you're called of God. It isn't fun. It's going to kill you. I've had people say, what's it like to study and get paid? You don't really want the answer to that question. Spurgeon used to say, if there's anything else you can do, men, do it. But if God has called you and appointed you, you're a slave, go. If you're here disobeying the call of God, go. You're a slave, obey, follow. I was a guy who never took any risk. I, my sweet little wife, she waited. We got married, and I, I, I lived at home all the way up to the last day. I'm embarrassed to say it. But I, I loved my mom. She was so sweet, and she made meals for me and did my laundry. And I just, I, I never took risk. I was a CPA. What's less risky than that? You know, I just, that was it. And I'll never forget that first night we packed up everything we had. We moved to California, and we unpacked it in 100-degree weather. We had no jobs and no money, and we laid down that night, and I said to Laura, what are we doing? <laughs> I'm going to give you some free marriage counseling. Don't do that. <laughs> it was just like God grabbed me by the nap of the neck and took me to seminary because I would have never done that. And I just want you to see is God, God calls us, and when he calls, we're, we're, we're slaves, and so Paul was commanded by God. He said it wasn't a choice. God called him to preach. And because he was a slave, he obeyed it at any cost or any price. Paul said this, For if I preach the gospel, I have nothing to boast of, for I am under compulsion. For woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. For if I do this voluntarily, I have a reward. But if against my will, I have a stewardship entrusted to me. God has called me to do this. I have to do it. And I'm now a steward. I have a stewardship to be faithful then to take God's word and to do it, to preach it and proclaim it and teach it. Preaching was not an option for Paul because he was a slave and God called him to do it. So let me try to bring this all together. God is a saving God. When he manifested his glory, it, he said, I'm a God who is merciful and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness. He, he made an eternal covenant because he is a saving God. He had a saving purpose when he created this whole world. He promised it before he even created it. Jesus was the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. And so he kept promising it then and working it out through all of history. And then he called Paul, and he says, Paul, now it has been fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Go preach Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And this is the means that God uses the Word of God to manifest the Word that became flesh. So the, the, Jesus is the fulfillment of this whole Word. Go preach this Word, which means to pro, pro, preach the One who became flesh, the Word who was manifested in our midst. And so now God goes and sends His preachers. And God's means is heralding the truth of this gospel. He doesn't use movies and all these things. Use the word of God preached and proclaimed. God's means is heralding the truth. 
And so reject the silliness of our day and all these other things and all these other methodologies and stick to the old paths. Stick to the Word of God, and I say expository preaching, where you keep going verse by verse, studying it, keeping it in the context, and learning it. There's an application then to all of us. What does this mean to me, Pastor? It sounds like you're preaching to yourself this morning. I'm not. Listen to what Mark, Jesus said in Mark 16, 15, after He's resurrected. He said to all the disciples, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. We are all called to Caruso this truth. That is not just the calling of a minister. This is a calling of every one of us to take this truth into this world. And we give our lives, our resources, our time, we give everything we have this one purpose, to lift up the name of Jesus Christ because those who look upon him will be saved and those who look upon him will be sanctified, and those who look upon him will be glorified. We have the beautiful message to lift up the glories and the beauties of Jesus Christ. What a calling that every one of us have. Caruso him. Go be a town crier. Let your city know. Let your neighborhood know. Quit sitting around with the greatest truth there is and keeping it under a bushel and hiding it. Uh, One preacher said we're like the, the Hudson River. We're frozen over at the mouth. You know, just go preach. Caruso. There's a world that needs it. There's a neighbor that needs it. There's a family member that needs it. And so here is it. What am I going to do? Am I going to be clever and witty? I'm going to share this Word of God as truthfully and as clearly as I know how. And I'm going to keep studying it to learn it clear and more truthfully and how to present it. I'm going to live in this gospel, and I am going to learn how to go share it. So Paul was committed to God's mastery of his life. He was committed to God's mission. He was committed to God's message. And he was committed to God's means of Caruso. And my last point, and we'll close out in verse 4, is Paul was committed to God's men. Verse 4, to Titus, my true child, and uh, this word koinia, uh, the root word for it, in this shared common faith. Titus, you're, we're, we're one. We've got this shared. You're, you're my true child. Grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus, our Savior. Paul, Paul's life was filled with people. I was trying to do a study and find out how many people he mentions in the New Testament that he was intimate with and mentioning. Just at the end of Romans, he had a boatload of them. I think there was like 40 to 50 names given in the New Testament that he was intimately acquainted with and working with. He had whole churches where he just loved them and they knew him. And there was just, Paul was just so given to people. I want you to listen to this passage in uh, 1 Thessalonians 2. Paul says this, For you yourselves know, brethren, that our coming to you was not in vain. But after we had already suffered and been mistreated in Philippi, as you know, We had the boldness in our God to speak to you the gospel of God amid much opposition. There's a cost, and he's speaking the gospel. For our exhortation does not come from error or impurity or by way of deceit, but just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak. We speak it, not as pleasing men. I'm not a men pleaser, but of God. I speak with one thing in mind, that it's God's truth, and I want to be approved by Him who examines our hearts. For we never came with flattering speech, as you know, nor with a pretext for greed. God is our witness. Nor did we seek glory from men, neither from you or from others, even though as apostles of Christ, we might have asserted our authority. We could have got gifts because you don't muzzle the ox. But we proved to be gentle among you, as a nursing mother tenderly cares for her own children. Having thus a fond affection for you, we were well and pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives. I didn't just give you truth. I imparted truth, but I gave you my very life. I I imparted myself into you because you had become very dear to us, koinia in the gospel. For you recall, brethren, our labor and hardship, 
how working night and day so as not to be a burden to any of you, we Caruso to you the gospel of God. You are witnesses and so is God. How devoutly and uprightly and blamelessly we behave towards you believers, just as you know how we were exhorting and encouraging and imploring each one of you as a father would his own children, so that you may walk in a manner worthy of the God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory, so that you would be conformed to godliness and you would walk in it. So we were tender, we were compassionate, we were like a father imploring you in your midst. We loved you and we cared about you. And so please don't miss this. Sometimes Paul seems gnarly, but he, he, Paul had such a tenderness to him. Paul was just committed to people. He, he was not the leader in the ivory tower. He, he's not just a, a theologian uh, uh, in, in his study. He didn't live in a Vatican. He loved people, and he poured his life into them. And I think this is the key to being an effective leader. Do you love people? Do you love people enough to pour truth into them? Paul entrusted the truth in ministry to Titus and to Timothy and many others. And so it wasn't just him doing it all. He equipped the saints for the work of service. Paul was equipping Timothy and Titus to take over strategic leadership of the great commission that had been given to him to take the gospel to the Gentiles. Titus had been saved under Paul's ministry, and there's this bond and there's this wonderful attachment that only you know when you're a father and, and a son or daughter in the faith. There, there's, a, there's a beautiful connection and love and oneness in it. 2 Corinthians 8.23, Paul says, As for Titus... He's my partner and fellow worker among you. As for our brethren, they are messengers of the church as a glory to Christ. And so please get this. We are not just called to preach and be cold and distant. There are some of you sitting here this morning that need to be rebuked, where you're just, you're cold and you're distant, but you know truth and you can jab everybody with it. You're, you're missing the heart of Paul and the gospel and what God is looking for. There are too many who are just, cold with the Word of God and don't really care. That isn't it. We're not traveling teachers who impart truth and we're done. We love and we engage those we teach. And there's a blessed bond in the faith. We pour into them the truth that God has taught us. I want to pour it into these younger men. Do you love people? If you don't, you'll never be a teacher here at Southside. I really don't care how much you know if you don't love people. You ever heard that saying, I don't care how much you know until I know how much you care? And that's what Paul was, is he, he loved these people. And he loved people, and he poured truth into their lives, and he did it as a father and as a nursing mother, and he was tender, and he cared, and he gave his life to people. I don't want the great seminary student teaching cold doctrine to people that you don't love. And so I, I pray that you're getting this message here at Southside. I pray that you're growing in the truth, the, the epigenosis, the full knowledge of God's word. It's producing a godliness and we're devoted to his word to impart it into people. But I, I do it by loving and engaging and caring about the people that I teach and serve and, and give this truth to. This is the, the, the commitments that made this great man of God, the Apostle Paul, one of my greatest heroes. It was an unbelievable what God did with him and what he accomplished through him. May we all be of one mind and spirit of what we're committed to here at Southside, that we would have integrity, that there would be an integrity to us, and we would be committed to God's mastery in our life. I, I, I want lordship. I want to be a slave to you, God. I want to be committed to your mission. I'm given to evangelism, and I'm given to edification, and I'm given to encouragement here in this body, in the body of Christ. I'm committed to God's message. I am committed to the truth of this word. This will always be it. Guys, learn this, preach it, proclaim it, teach it. We don't need opinions and worldly thoughts when people are suffering, struggling, needing to grow know this word, know how to sow it into people in love and to help them. Be committed to God's means 
It, it isn't just praying for someone that they'll be saved and then never sharing with them. It's safe to pray for them. It's unsafe to share. And uh, to, to love them enough that I pray and then I will Russo, I'll share truth and I'll quit being frozen over at the mouth. I love this gospel too much to just be quiet in a world that's perishing without Christ. And then lastly, I'm a man committed to God's men or women. I'm committed to, to passing it on and to loving people and being engaged in their lives and doing this together, shoulder to shoulder. And so may we all join together in a holy commitment to love and to serve one another in this way. I, I pray that we'll unite in this one goal to put God on display, to glorify him by obeying and these commitments that Paul was committed to. So let's go to our God and we will pray. Father, I thank you for what we have learned uh, already in Titus. I thank you for Paul opening up his heart and showing us what drove this man, what, what made him such a powerful leader, what were his commitments. And we do see an integrity to him that he would never turn away from the truth of this word. Lord, it, it, it was entrusted to him. He was called and he obeyed. And therefore, he had a stewardship given to him. And so I pray that we would all see the same, Lord, that you've entrusted us with this gospel. You've entrusted us with the lives and the gifts that you have given to us. And you want us to use them and to sow them and to take the truth that we've learned to bring to the lost that they might have faith, to bring to the saints that they might grow and work through the things they're struggling with, and to bring hope, to bring the hope of where all this is leading because we're prone to start trying to make Denver our hope. And so, God, let us be committed to what our real hope is and encouraging one another when we're suffering and struggling and kids are wandering and all the different battles that are in this place. God, let us look to that day when Jesus is going to return and consummate and make all things new. God, it is certain you can't lie. We bank on it. We live on it. I thank you for it, and I pray let every heart find great joy this morning and this blessed hope. God, let us be committed to give our lives to one another as we're going to move in this book. Let us disciple and mentor and teach and train and admonish and encourage one another all the way to that final breath. God, we need you for this. We need you, your grace to act in this church. We want to be obedient to the call. And so we pray that you will bless us in this. In Christ's name, amen.